check, check, check. It is six o'clock. I'm going to call the meeting to order. The meeting has been noticed to Evans Print and Media Group, WCOW Radio, Magnum Radio, La Crosse Tribune, Sparta City Hall, and Sparta Free Library. Mr. Russ, are there any changes to the agenda? No, there is not. All right. I'll request a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. A motion from Ms. Presswood. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second from Mr. McKenna. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. If everybody would please stand and face the flag for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Mr. Russ, if you could please uh, state the Sparta Area School District's mission statement. Yes, our mission statement is to educate all students academically, emotionally, and socially to inspire curiosity and resilience. Thank you for that. All right, item F, we have Mr. Sonneman and party here in front of us. So new this year, new this year, we thought we'd get some students in front of the board, in front of everybody that's viewing on the World Wide Web tonight, not to put any more pressure on you guys, but thank you very much for being here tonight. And thank you for all the family members that are here tonight uh, for their musical selection. So Mr. Sonneman is our uh, middle school choir director and has a group of students here. Uh, what grades, Mr. Sonneman? This is seventh grade. So once again, guys, thank you very much. And Mr. Sonneman, you have the floor.
Holy moly. I, I feel like we need to end on a high note and adjourn this meeting. <laughs> was, don't, don't, here. don't tempt people. Yeah, we right. need a motion in a second. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, thank you all so much. We sure appreciate that. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Great job, kids. Wow, that was awesome. All right. That was lovely. I know, right? Mr. Russ, item G, commendation. Mr. Fromm, if you could step down in the middle here in the front, that'd be great. Well, at the last meeting, we introduced Mr. Fromm's replacement. And this meeting, we wanted to give Mr. Fromm an accommodation for 38 years of service to the Sparta Area School District. Um, yes. So when I first started education back in many years ago, the, the more experienced veteran teachers um, used to joke with me about they've been uh, teaching and in education longer than I've been alive. And I can tell you, Mr. Fromm is pretty close to this number. Uh, I am a little bit older than that without giving too much information. But the amount of years that Mr. Fromm has had service to our district is fantastic. And 38 years, it's hard for us to fathom. Um, and nowadays, people go from job to job in different organizations. And I'm one of them on my seventh or eighth organization. And Mr. Fromm for the last 38 years has had one. So we wanted to have Mr. Fromm in front of us today to give a commendation and uh, just thank him for many years of service. Wish him nothing but the best uh, as he enters retirement in the next chapter of his life. So Mr. Fromm, would you like to say any few words? No, but thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, hey, Mr. Hey, Fromm. Real quick, Mr. Russ, any board members have anything they wanna say? I just want to give everybody a chance. I guess I do. And really very short and simple, thank you. And more importantly, congratulations. Yeah, Lowell, congratulations, man. Great, great career. Thank you for, for being a part of the district for this many years, just phenomenal. So with that, thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Russ, do we have any public input? I do not believe we have any public input for this meeting. All right, thank you very much. Um, moving on to item two reports, um, 2A Southside Early Learning Center report, Ms. Everson Riley. Thank you. All right. When I asked the Southside team to help me showcase the school and our efforts, the crew was ready to make a two hour docu documentary. <laughs> After considering our time, we decided to stick to the foundation of what we do. A special thanks to Kathy, um, she's our in interventionist, and Lisa Johnson, our behavior and instructional coach um, for making the video and doing all the legwork. I can't really take credit. Mm. I might not even be able to move these slides. <laughs> um, so at Southside, we believe the children deserve to build their learning on top of the strongest foundation possible which includes social emotional learning, a balanced literacy approach, meaningful math activities, and a spirit of being thankful. Here are some examples of a social emotional learning supports in our classrooms that help children take ownership of calming themselves and using problem solving. We use calming men menus to allow children the choice of how to become mindful. We use solution cards to allow the children to practice ways to fix their problems. We teach and reteach red and green choices as a way of directly teaching about behaviors. A 4K student takes a mindful moment break. Children are taught how to be kind to themselves and others as displayed in the caring tree and we celebrate how each of us is in, unique in our all about me work. We post and review our rules and expe expectations, which you will see in the video clip of a K class room reviewing rules before they begin. So could you play that video? Clip is maybe a better word. Yeah. Play, 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 play
So they were be reviewing the rules. There's like five of them, but we just gave you a short clip. Um, that's part of our morning meeting. We'll just keep going. Um, we, we use, whoops, I got it. Is that right? Yep. We use a balanced approach to literacy with phonics, reading, and writing, all coming together through the readers and writers workshop models. We use hands-on activities with play-based approach as seen here in the find it, pop it letter game. Our routines are predictable and repetitive as displayed here with our foundations of vowel stretch. And you could play that clip then please. Here is some more literacy in action with the 4K class making gingerbread man. Thank you. Um, to chase after while the K classes are writing and selling their own books in their bookstore. Um, here is a clip of how we make phonics more active with our Hegarty program. And that's the top one. Subtraction, what kind of sign am I going to use? My this is math, but that's okay. We can. Your turn. Okay. Yes. yes. Mess. All right, boys and girls, do you know what I'm seeing? Not everybody's saying the words with me. Ugly. Wait, remember the only way to get our brains to grow is we have to do our hands and the words. Can you do it with me? Miss Cross Applesauce, here is the beginning sounds. Here's the first word that we have today. Or your turn. Four, good. Next, boys. Oh, yeah. Um, so then we also do the watch the fun progression as you see a clip of a K class using Hagerty. So Hagerty is used in both 4K and K. So that's the bottom one. Ready? I'll say it. You say it. Ass. Ass. Action. It. Ass. Last one. Wind. Okay. So you can see that those hand motions are the same and those are given um, in the Hagerty program for us to use. During math, we build a number sense of our small group and center-based activities. We use a variety of strategies and tools, including technology to ensure each student is engaged with their learning. We can watch that clip. Subtraction, what kind of sign am I going to use? Minus. Minus. Oh, minus. Good, Ava. Okay. Now, here's the sad part. Some of the presents are going to be away. How many are in my hand? Two. Two. So I'm going to write two here. And then I need a, what kind of sign? Minus. Okay, now how would I figure out my answer? What would I do? Hey, Trey. Yeah, you're hiding. Trey, find a different seat. This one's in box. Oh, I can ask a picture strategy. Good, okay. Now I have to get rid of how many? Two. So I could do the dots or I could count what's left here. There's three left. So those are the small groups. And a lot of times we call that the teacher table where they come over and they learn from the teacher.
And then um, just to end, we would want to end this evening with a sincere note of appreciation for the update of our building awning. The students and the staff really appreciate it. And there it is, looking all so good. We love it. And you can see that we took that picture on the snowiest day we've had so far. So <laughs> do you nice. have any questions for us or me? Any questions or comments from committee members? More comment than question. Um, I really appreciated the time you, you allowed me to come to the school and wow, is there a lot of energy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but your staff is phenomenal. Um, yeah. there, there wasn't a lot of, I didn't see direction. People just knew what needed to get done and, and they did it. Um, everybody was willing to pitch in and, and a four-year-old, a five-year-old may not know exactly what they're doing. Um, and you were very adept at seeing that and just getting them going in the right direction. It was, it was fantastic. Yeah, thanks. We really enjoy our jobs, so it's fun. Yeah, thanks to the three of you for posting the update. I like the awning, like how it looks and all the great videos. So, so we really appreciate that. Yeah, perfect. All right, have a great thank, evening. Thank you. All right, item 2B, Mr. Russ, uh, Cataract Elementary School Committee Report. You want me down there or you want me up here? Okay. Just checking. <laughs> well, thank, good evening, everybody. Um, I just want to introduce some people up here tonight. Uh, we have Miss Arlene Sprague, uh, Miss Jessica Carter, and Mr. Justin Drury as part of our CAPAC community uh, committee. I uh, also Thank Ms. Heidi Presswood as part of the committee as well. Um, Ms. Lopez was part of it. Mr. Schulze was part of it. Mr. McKenna was part of it. So, uh, and we also had five or six more additional community members that are part of this committee report. And uh, we spent some time, this is the second time we went to RFP for the Cataract Elementary School. And this is just the timeline, just to review it. On October 3rd, it was re-released with a, a November 2nd and 10th optional tour. Uh, we did have some organizations and people tour them at that time. They were optional. They were not required. On December 1st, uh, actually all the proposals were due on November 30th. And then on December 1st, the committee got together again and made the determination to interview both Mr. Roger Castle and the Cataract Essential Services Incorporated for, uh, to further their uh, information about their proposals. Uh, and tonight... Uh, we do have our report to the board for the committee, and uh, I do want to let you know that we do have a uh, appraisal of the land is planned in January of 2023 uh, if we decide to continue to go in that direction. So that was just a brief overview of the timeline. Some highlights of both proposals. Uh, Mr. Castle, uh, he offered uh, 50000 for the entire property. Potential uses, these are just as brainstorming of childcare, pet boarding and care, secondhand shop, uh, swap meets, and business incubator. During the interview, uh, Mr. Castle mentioned that the daycare, depending on finding, that might not be realistic because trying to find licensed daycare uh, providers and that sort of thing were very difficult to do these days. Mr. Castle has several businesses in the Black River Falls area to possibly uh, midsummer opening if he was selected uh, for this, given the timeline. Uh, and he also anticipated about $100,000 in renovations. Um, Cataract Essential Services Incorporated, the offer was $10,000 for the entire property. Uses were rental space for a daycare after school program, wedding celebrations, food pantry, library, community events uh, for the gathering place. There was an anonymous donor, gave the offer price of $10,000. They're looking to set up a nonprofit organization uh, to oversee the property and the expenses and revenues were outlined in their proposal. Committee discussions and interview information. The committee wanted to thank both Mr. Castle and Cataract Essential Services for their time and energy. They were both, both groups were very passionate about the property. Um, both said that we could, the uh, Sparta Area School District could continue to use their property, the parking lot, or a bus stop. They mentioned that they would make sure that it was maintained. 
Um, so we were very pleased with that. For the playground equipment, Mr. Castle said he wanted to keep that in the community and would donate to that off property. He is not looking to keep that on property. While the Cataract uh, Essential Services said that they would like to keep the, uh, the playground equipment on their property for community use. The committee had discussion, had a lot of discussions on purpose over price or price over purchase either way. And we discussed options to maybe parcel the land. When we asked both groups about that, the Cataract Essential Services said that, you know what, we'd have to look into it more, they'd have to discuss it, but they could be potentially open to it. While Mr. Castle said he would not be uh, at this time open to parceling it off. So our committee recommendations, I'm going to review these with the team or with the board, and then I'm gonna ask any uh, community, member, uh, committee, committee member to add anything they wish. Um, the committee recommendation, and we wanted to emphasize purpose over price, uh, the cataract community enhancement, which we talked about. The committee was split on whether the, uh, we should look to uh, the land should be separated from the proposal. We were split. We didn't have a consensus one way or another in regards to splitting off the land. And I think that's just a, a, a testament of we didn't always agree on everything, which is perfectly fine. It wasn't yes, 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 yes. We had some good discussion. Thank you, Mr. Donkey. Um, and um, we did want to recommend that the priority of the committee was the purpose over the price. And if the if the board agreed to that, they would recommend canceling the appraisal to save the district some money. Um, we also recommend to the board that does not offer the prop, and if we do offer the property to anyone, that the district would have first rights of refusal if they needed to turn around and sell it. So if either one said that, yep, we're gonna buy it, we come to an agreement, the district being we, and then they come to say, hey, I'm, you know, I'd like to sell it, the district would have that first right of refusal to, to buy the property or say, no, not at this time. So our final recommendation is, is based off the written proposals and interviews, the committee recommends the board explore the offer by community essential, I'm sorry, Cataract Essential Services over Mr. Castles. Jessica, Arlene, anything you'd wanna add? So one of the reasons was because of building relationships also. And um, we're all aware that some of those relationships have been severed a little bit. And with their proposal, the Cat Cataract Essentials proposal, it actually involves community, not just from Cataract, but also Sparta. They used to hold the, and in their proposal, it was listed to do the Halloween party do the chicken cues and different things like that to bring back some of that joinment and connection to maybe heal some of those efforts um, and to make it just more community serviced and pretty much that's why we kind of did that. Any other board members wish to add anything from the committee? perspective. Ms. Prestwood, I know you were in there. Anything else you'd like to add? Um, I think just kind of after discussion that we had in the last meeting that uh, speaking on some of what Ms. Sprague had just talked about is that this building is important to the community and we ourselves have had lots of discussions on how we would possibly move forward with this and there were a lot of uh, unknowns with both proposals, um, but we felt that CES would take more ownership in the building and have more pride within the building um, and that they're going to work very, very hard to make sure that this succeeds. Um, I, I think as we go into closed session later, we, we think about those things and, and bridging that gap that has been created and, and making these relationships whole again. Mrs. Lopez, anything from you? You're good? All right. Mr. McKenna? Was there any conversation about what the first right of refusal would look like? What not necessarily look like, but it just at least um, we would have the opportunity, we mean the district, 
would have the opportunity to buy the property back if we saw a value for it for the district first prior to it being put up on, on the market or anything like that. So it was just an option to have the district have the opportunity to repurchase that if the if the district felt that that would be in their best interest in the future. I have later learned that I believe that the same thing happened when Leon took over. So it would just make sense to do it again. We don't have to sell, we don't have to buy it. If we were offered it, it would just be a, an option that we would keep. I, I understand. I was just wondering if there was gonna be a timeline that was put on it or an indefinite through the first sale, but not go on beyond that, I would assume, correct? It would be only the first, I, I don't wanna speak for the committee, but it was my understanding to be just the first sale. Um, I just wanna thank all the members of the committee. I, I know how much, how hard this was, uh, you have numerous conversations, and I just wanna thank you for supporting your community coming out. I, it was a lot of extra time for you, but you could see it was worth it to you to be there and to be a part of it. So thank you for that. So thank you very much and kind of echoing, we wanna thank the entire committee for being there because it did take a lot of time and um, you know, it, it, time is very valuable and we had some good discussions. We didn't always agree, but it was nice to have those discussions. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you all. All right, item 2C, Professional Learning Community Report. Ms. Mansky. So I know we've talked a lot about professional learning communities, PLCs, PLCs, PLCs. And I wanted to take a little bit of time tonight to make sure that we all understand what I mean when I say PLCs. So I'm starting with a learning target. By the end of this presentation, you will be able to explain the professional learning community process to your neighbor. I won't really hold you to that. <laughs> so the definition of a PLC, <clears throat> it's a collaborative group of teachers with the goal to improve student learning through growth and achievement. It's a continuous improvement of instructional practice. There's a cyclical process to it that's driven by data. So I have a few videos. We'll start with Mr. Roddick, who is very passionate about PLCs and he is one of the people who first brought PLCs to Sparta. Hi, this is Mike. I'm here to talk about what I think is most important about PLCs. First, the camaraderie in relationships that, that the staff builds together is amazing. Um, so rather than having eight first grade teachers alone in their classrooms, they, they are really working together and building some personal re relationships as well. Next, I really like um, how they can learn from each other's successes and failures. And finally, like leveraging each other's ideas, they can immediately respond to a student's needs. So that's what I think about PLCs. And Mr. Roddick just does a really great job when we're having discussions of, of bringing that PLC process um, to the front. So if we're discussing how we're going to make a decision, he'll say, well, I can make a decision, but if it's really going to be a PLC decision, this is how it needs to go. So he's always got that frame of reference that he brings to, to our whole group. The next video is from Southside Early Learning Center. And this, I, there's a couple of things I want you to notice in this video. One, I want you to look at the layout of the room, how they're sitting. And two, I want you to, if you can hear, it's a little quieter, but listen closely to what they're discussing and see if you can catch some of the social emotional learning aspects in their discussion. All right, Mr. Gonke, I'm ready. I kind of piggybacking off of the escalation and they just, like they said, the change of scene. Like it's sometimes it's just the teacher and the child themselves need a separation and a moment away to, to just to bring a cycle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find the glitter jar works great. <laughs> yeah, like I we've tried that with a student and not many words, but your body looks like this. Watch this calm down, your body will calm down. And that's all I had to say. And then it worked. So you'll notice that they sat in a circle. 
that circle is part of that responsive classroom. They always sit in a circle for that morning meeting. So they've structured some of their um, PLC time when they're together as a full pre-K and K meeting in that circle setting. Um, you also heard about, it was hard to hear, but she was talking about how sometimes when the child is, is really escalated, um, just needing a break to be away from the teacher, the teacher needs that and the student needs that, they need a break from each other. And then she was also mentioning that glitter, glitter jar and how when you shake it up, you know, it's everything's everywhere and then they can kind of calm their body. So that social and emotional learning is really part of that PLC process and the discussions that happen there as well. Hi, this is Mike. I'm trying to figure out how to get to the next slide. Thank you. <laughs> um, so there are four questions to a PLC and we'll dive a little bit deeper into those as we go. Question one, what do we want students to know and be able to do? Question two, how will we know if each student has learned it? Question three, what do we do if they are not understanding? And question four, what do we do if they do understand it? So for question one, what do we want students to know and be able to do? One of the big tasks that we do as a PLC is we look at those essential standards. So you've heard me talk a lot about guaranteed and viable curriculum, looking at those essential standards, and then taking those standards and determining what is the learning target. So just like I started today's presentation with a learning target, teachers are bringing that learning target to the kids. So they know, what am I supposed to be getting out of this lesson? And then breaking it down into proficiency skills. And I'll show you what that looks like in the next few slides. This is an example, I know you can't read all the words, but this is an example of a high school chemistry. So in their unit, um, they've taken and broken it down into these essential standards. Chemical and physical properties of materials can be explained by the structure and the arrangements of atoms, ions, or molecules, and the forces between them. And I could read the whole thing, but you get the point. They've gone through that whole unit and said, these are those two big ideas in this unit. That's what's essential. Are we going to teach the other standards? Absolutely. But these two essential ones, that's what we're really going to focus on and make sure that the majority of our students are able to master those essential standards. On the bottom here, you can also see that they've broken it down into learning targets. And on the next slide, you'll see an example of some sixth grade learning targets. So we start with that big idea, that essential standard, and then we break that down into smaller targets that the students can learn. So I'll just read a couple of them here. I can explain with the model tilt of the Earth's axis of rotation. I can explain how the Earth rotates on its tilted axis once an Earth day. Um, so the kids know, what am I really focusing on today? And then this next slide is an example of a proficiency scale. We could also call it a rubric. And that orange box is the standard. And then um, in the far left where it says criteria, that's what the, what the language for that standard is in easy to understand parent language. That would be on the report card. So we can see that parent-friendly language is solves addition and subtraction word problems within 100. And then when we look at that secure, that number three, that gives those examples of what a child can do if they are secure in that standard. And then in the middle, what they can do if they're developing in that standard. And then what, what are they, for this, in this example, they need teacher support to be able to solve the problems if they're beginning. Um, so that this really helps the teachers to be on the same page with their understanding. So what exactly are they looking for when they're, when they're watching kids um, with these standards and making sure that there's that consistency. It doesn't matter which teacher they have, a two means a two across the board. So question number two, how will we know if a student has learned it? That's where we're getting into those common assessments. And those assessments, we align to those essential standards. So the most essential things from the unit, that's what the majority of the test is going to cover as well. Um, assessments could be formative assessments, which we use along the way as they're learning in small chunks, or that summative that we would do at the end of that unit. Um, part of question number two is also analyzing those assessment results. Part of that analyzing is looking at how's the whole group doing? Do I need to reteach this? Or looking at individual students that might struggle as well. And then part of that discussion is also, man, your kids really rocked the standard and mine struggled. What did you do that I didn't do? Do you have any tips that could help me teach this better? So really diving into those instructional practices. 
And then question number three, what do we do if they're not understanding? So one of the first things we do if the majority of our students, if 80% are getting it, great, we can move on. But if we're not at that point, I might need to reteach the whole class, some part of that instruction. If 80% are achieving that mastery, then I'm going to look at that remaining 20% or 10% or whatever that percent is that's not understanding yet. And I have a couple of options. One is to teach them within my own class in a small group setting. That teacher table example that we saw from Ms. Everson Riley's presentation from Southside. The other thing that we can do to address that is by pulling students out to do specific interventions on the skill deficits that they have. And then question four, what do they do if they are understanding? So through that formative and summative data, I've identified some students who are really understanding the standard well. And so my next steps with them are to help the student apply that standard in a different or deeper way or they could, I can help them explore the next grade level standard. So you heard me talk a little bit about um, vertical alignment, or not this past Wednesday, but the week before, we spent our whole PLC time doing vertical alignment. And what that means is that a team was able to meet with the grade level above or the grade level below the grade that they teach. This was really powerful and there were some amazing um, discussions in all of the rooms and some great takeaways. So some of the main things that, that I saw as positives from this day were that the team was able to determine how the rigor of a standard increases at each grade. So for example, there's a reading standard that's pretty much K through 12. That's about main ideas and details. So if I don't really dive into how does that increase in difficulty from third grade to fourth grade to fifth grade to sixth grade? If I'm always just assessing it and teaching it at the same level, I'm not getting to the, that difficulty or the rigor of the standard. So there were some adjustments that were made to proficiency scales following this discussion to make sure that they were bumping up the work that students were doing between grade levels. They also took some time to share strategies for teaching standards. So how do you teach this in third grade then the fourth grade teachers can say, well, last year you learned this. And so we're cementing that prior knowledge. What did you use last year? I'm reminding you that before I dive into the new. I'm, they're able to connect that new learning to a place with that previous learning in their brains. That another big takeaway from the vertical alignment was it helped teachers to identify the gaps and the redundancies between grades. So maybe I don't need to spend quite so much time on this because I know the grade before me. Seventh grade spends a whole ton of time on this. So in eighth grade, maybe we're just going to revisit it briefly and move on to something new. And then there was a discussion about vocabulary between grade levels. So I was in the second and third grade room when they were discussing the word some. And uh, the, the third grade teacher said, the kids don't know what some is. And the second grade teacher said, oh, that's because I always call it a total. So just that discussion about the vocabulary that we're using from grade to grade and making sure that we're using the vocabulary that they need for the next grade level. And another thing that they discussed in a lot of the rooms was that SEL, that social emotional learning. And what are things that you're doing at your grade level that are working and maybe what's not working so I can try different things in my room. We already saw one of these videos, the Meadowview video we saw last time during the middle school presentation, but I will have us watch the high school video, which is, has two teachers, one for electives and one for social studies. GVC work in our district has supported electives because it's given our elective teachers the framework to develop consistent practice throughout our departments. The PLC process has helped social studies as a department itself by being able to identify some of the standards that spread across all classes rather than just looking at our classes on an individual basis, but seeing that you can have one individual assessment in four, five, six different classes that help bring the team together and also for create those common assessments throughout all grade levels. GVC work. Big win. Okay. <laughs> so some of our big accomplishments as PLCs over the past couple of years, even I would say. One would be collaboration and building that collective understanding for the process of PLCs. 
We've also created standards-based report cards for Herman, Southside Early Learning Center, and Montessori's will be kicking their, their first one out here, very right now, actually. Um, common assessments is something that we've been working a lot on over the last year and then into this year as well, um, working on those across grade levels and content teams. We have a big celebration, and we heard a little bit about this from Mr. Ott and Mr. Dow at the last meeting, that intervention for all at the middle school instead of just interventions for kids who need reteaching or remediation. And then finally, South, the Sparta High School is meeting weekly in their content teams to work on aligning essential standards to their units. So I started with a learning target. And if I was mean, I would make you do that <laughs> to revisit and, and make sure that you understood. But I will ask you at this time, do you have any questions about professional learning communities? Any questions at all from committee members? I have one. Go for it. Okay. So in a uh, previous slide, you mentioned that when you have students that master or they perform really well at the standard that's being taught, and then they can explore the next grade level. Um, so then do those teachers work more cohesively with those to make sure that those students succeed at that next grade level? Or what, what does that look like? So I would say it's more of an exploration we actually encourage te teachers to go deeper rather than further um, because we do get into that challenge then what happens when they're in the next grade and what happens when they're in the next grade. So if we get to this level of a standard with the rigor, um, looking at how can the student apply that standard in a different way, in a, in a, in a more challenging, deeper way. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely a challenge. We, we struggle to enrich sometimes um, and we focus on those kids who haven't mastered that standard. Um, so we're trying to get better at how do we extend our students that need those extensions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions or comments? Mrs. Lopez, go ahead. Yes, I have a question, please. But first, I want to say thank you for that honest response. That's very important. <laughs> um, the, the definition of a PLC includes a collaborative group of teachers. So I guess, excuse my inexperience here, but is every teacher involved in a PLC every week or every other week? That's actually and, a fabulous question. And then does it include teacher's aides and how far down the scale does it go? Or not down, but across, right? Thank you. I love those questions. So first of all, yes, it does include all teachers. And you heard um, Ms. Hughes talking about as an electives teacher, sometimes there's you're the only one that teaches that particular class. Um, we run into that a lot at the high school level. There's singleton, so they, they're the only one that teaches this. And so what we've done this year is we've started um, working with our PLC or with our electives te teachers to say, well, your content is different, but let's dive into the portrait of a Spartan. And so they're looking at one of those nine knowledge skills or dispositions, and they're using that as that discussion, that commonality. We're all focusing on that collaboration in our classrooms. And um, how do we gather data on how they're doing with collaboration? How do we create that proficiency scale of what collaboration looks like and what are some ways, some projects, some areas that we can embed those practices within what we're doing so that they are part of a collaborative group. Then your second question was about who do we include? Um, so you asked specifically about our educational assistants and during that vertical alignment day, we did include our, our um, educational assistants. Um, We've also talked about, you know, maybe doing some different training for educational assistance on those early release days. Um, we do also have a lot of our um, educational assistants that do work at the WIN after school program. So where it gets tricky is we need, we need to, to have the staff with our, with our um, students that attend WIN. How do we do that and support the professional development and the growth that they need to be effective in their jobs as well? And it's kind of that really fine balance. Ms. Mansky, I had a, oh, I'm sorry, was there somebody else? Yeah, I just thought to, Go for um, it. we've also incorporated our interventionists, reading and math interventionists, our special ed, student, uh, special ed teachers and um, our interventionists. They join the grade level PLCs as well, the teams, um, so that they know that universal, that tier one guaranteed and viable curriculum work. So they need to know that, that, that level to be able to support the students that they pull out as well. And Ms. Mansky, you notate the accomplishments here. We have interventions for a specific group of students uh, to now intervention for all. Are you, are you um, 
do you have enough support for, to be able to do that and, and to provide that full support to all of our students through your interventionists? Yeah, so what that looks like is it's actually not just interventionists. So the intervention block is where students are getting what they need. So the students that need reteaching in that small group setting, that group of students would be pulled by our interventionists. Then we've still got our grade level teachers. So for example, all of the seventh grade teachers together are, are saying, this is what our students need. This, this group of 12, of 12 students really need a reteaching on this part of the math unit. And they're reteaching them within that setting. But these 20 kids, they've already mastered it. So let's go further with them. Let's plan a project-based learning activity using this skill and have them explore and go deeper with it. So they're all getting what they need. They're just not all getting like that remedial intervention, if that makes sense. Thank you very much. So just to clarify, the, there is enough support as of right now. Some of the groups do get big, but yes, they've, they've gotten really creative about how to, how to use the staff that they have to um, plan that time the best that they can. Well, that's reassuring to hear. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments from committee members? Thank you, Ms. Mansky. Thank you. Uh, item D, facilities report from Mr. Russ. Looking at the wrong one. All right, before we get into the facility uh, report, I do want to make it more well known, I guess, that we are not looking at going to referendum in April of uh, 2020. Does it say four? That should say 2023. I apologize and I'll switch that. We're not going to referendum in April of 2023. Um, and there is no November election or November referendum on the books or November election even on the books for 2023. So uh, we are not going in November of 2020, uh, April of 2023. Um, so before we get into the, uh, um, you know, areas for a facility study coming up, I do want to touch upon Memorial Field real quick. Uh, Memorial Field is pretty much done. Uh, we have the doors put in for the enclosures underneath the west side of the stands. We have the wonderful fencing along Rusk Avenue, and we're very, very close to being done with the project. We need some more education on some things with that to fulfill our contract with Markin and Johnson, but we are very close. Uh, to being done, done with that. So we're very excited and we're still planning graduation on there, uh, weather permitting, of course, um, uh, in, in May. So um, very proud of that project and finishing that up. Um, for our facility, we're looking at doing a facility study to gain a better understanding of what our needs are in the district. Uh, five, six years ago, we did uh, our facility study and we created Herman uh, based on community input, uh, committees and that sort of thing. Uh, we went to Herman and we got our 1-4 building, moved uh, middle school from 4-8 uh, to 5-8, and SHS was pretty much left alone. We had some Montessori, uh, Lawrence Lawson, and Maplewood renovations, but now it's time for us to relook at what our needs are based on our current configurations. Um, we're looking at studying Sparta High School, which includes the auditorium. One thing that we'll be doing, uh, I'll be asking for next week, uh, is about uh, not to exceed twenty thousand dollars for a RF to go to, to 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 go to a vendor and really dive dive into what we our auditorium needs are lighting, sound. Uh, there are specify there are specific vendors who do that. Um, so having Mr. Drury or myself or Mr. Blaha or even Mr. Erickson or Ms. Schneider walk through those. It's it's it, it's wonderful to do that, but we need to get some uh, some uh, some professional eyes on that to really give us some options about what that's going to be. So at the next committee meeting, if it's uh, or at the next meeting uh, a week from today, we'll be asking to take that away from Fund 46, uh, and if that's the will of the board, we'll go in that direction. But uh, the rest of Sparta High School needs to be looked at. We have some needs in our kitchen area, our outdoor spaces. Um, some of our technology inside. Um, our envelope is, is, is very strong. However, it's a 1962 envelope, uh, which is the main envelope. And then we have some additions there. So we'll be taking a look at the whole uh, totality of SHS. Meadowview. Meadowview is getting up there in age now. It's over 20 years old. So we'll be looking at that as well, uh, specifically their outdoor spaces, um, you know, their, their, their activity spaces, their playground, their, the parking lots, and what kind of storage do we have? Do we need to build an outside storage? Do we need indoor storage? You know, this, what, this is a wonderful facility, this, this cafetorium here, 
it doesn't need some upgrades, you know, with sound and light here, if we're looking to do a little bit more. Um, so really taking a look at those are the two main areas. And then if we want to add the, I know in the past, we've talked about full day kindergarten, that might be coming down the pike. Uh, it's not on the books or anything right now for, for full time, but you know, maybe we look at that. What does that future expansion looks like? Uh, school forest. We have a wonderful opportunity out there. I know Mr. Cook's worked very hard on that. Is there an opportunity there? A boardroom, not to say that this is not a very good boardroom or anything like that, but um, do we wanna look at options there? We have some land by Portland or in the Cashton area. Would that be something we'd like to sell possibly? Right now it's, it's, it's not being used very much. We have the, I don't know the full story about why we have it, but we do have some property out there as well. And there might be other areas that we're not thinking about, you know, or as a cabinet or administrative team, we've talked about some things about what we need, but once again, really to get those experts in and say, this is the best practice. This is what we need um, for our facilities. And part of our facilities is that technology. I mentioned SHS um, with our uh, career and technical education. We have a wonderful welding program, uh, machining, woods, construction, auto, and even future expansions that equipment's getting outdated. So, you know, how can we look to do that um, with possible needs as well? So, and there might be other areas of study, but uh, those are the, some of the big ones. Any questions on the facility report? Questions or comments from committee members? Go ahead, Mr. Burns Gilbert. Thanks, Mr. Russ. Um, appreciate all the updates. One. Quick question, maybe back to Memorial Field. Do you have any updates on the gridiron status, the fundraising process they were undertaking? I do not, but I can get you that. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my question, uh, kind of going through those different possible areas to explore, um, you mentioned that last piece there about technology. Can technology be included in some of the Fund 46 expenditures or is that have to be more specific to I thought that was facilities only right it's it's facility upgrades only and it has to be on our capital improvement or a long range plan so I would say no to the technology the reason why we can have the auditorium out of fund 46 because that's specifically listed in our long range pro our long range planning so yes. technology would not be I would say no because that would have to be a capital improvement okay Thanks. And to segue off of that, Mr. Russ, so uh, talking about the auditorium, are you saying that administration is going to come to the board next week and ask to have that removed from Fund 46 and not do the updates to the auditorium? No, I just want to make sure I'm clear. Yep, I, you're clear. We're going to we're planning on in, unless the, the will of the board is different. We're planning on bringing a action item for the board to act on to um, to fund out of Fund 46 our next steps in the, in that process. Okay. Thank you for that. I yes. just wanted the clarification because I thought I had yeah. heard something else. So, okay. No. I appreciate that. Uh, the other thing is two areas of study. Um, I know uh, locker room scenario, there's a, mm -hmm. a locker room situation. So I know that that's part of the areas of study. Can you think of any other areas, Mr. Russ, that we really want to focus on? The facility study will help us with that, but yeah. there's a lot of, you know, do we need another outdoor space for, do we need to add another gym? Uh, facility space? Do we want to add a walking track? I know West Salem and other in Black River Falls has a walking track for community use. So it's really to keep our mind open to what are some ideas that we have, not just for our district, but we're looking at a community use uh, opportunity as well by adding locker rooms, adding gyms, um, adding an outdoor, we'll shoot for the moon, an outdoor field house somewhere. Um, additional space that can be used for our community along with our, our district. Once again, ideas, we're not going to go do those things, obviously, but they're just ideas. And those are some other ideas that we've talked about in the past. You know, our locker rooms do need, you know, we have our, I'll just leave it at that. Our locker rooms do need some <laughs> upgrade at SHS. Perfect. All right. Thank you for that, Mr. Russ. Any other questions or comments? Mr. McKenna, go ahead. Could you elaborate on the, the Portland Cashin land just a little bit? You know how much we have? Is it used at all? It is not used at all. Uh, we do get uh, requests to, to hunt on it. And we have said no to those, no, those requests just in case we have other opportunities. But um, 
it is, I, like I said, I don't have all the information, but I believe it was gifted to us many years ago. And it is, it's a hillside. Uh, approximately how many acres? Any I will idea? get you all that information okay. in the weekly notes. Okay. Thank you. So, but it's, it's not very, it's not buildable. It's. Sounds like good hunting land. Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> All right, further questions, comments? Thank you for that. Um, item 2E, finance report, Ms. Lehner. Uh, yes, um, somebody please wave their hands. Yeah, we don't, don't want to lose Mr. Ford. Know, you better what, stand up and run around there, there Mr. Ford. Um, uh, Ms. Lehner Zanone is here to give our financial report. Uh, she is our district accountant. And before she gives the report, I'm still trying to learn exactly what a school district accountant actually does. I think I know what regular accountants do, but I really don't know what they do besides punch numbers all day and do those wonderful things. But I know they do much more than that. So, Michelle, would you like to give a little background on what you do uh, as well for everybody? Oh, I, I'm sorry. We need. <laughs> yeah, this doesn't help. <laughs> All right, I am the keeper of the school district's books. So. <laughs> I work closely with the building secretaries and the district secretaries when they are coding the purchases. I keep the district compliant with the DPI's chart of accounts. That's called the woofer. I also keep the district compliant with GAP, which are generally accepted accounting principles, and GASB, which is governmental accounting standards board principles and district policy. I also prepare numerous amount of reports that are required to be filed by the DPI, the state and the federal government, such as payroll, 941s, W-2s, 1099s. Uh, I also work on the workers' comp audit, um, annual WRS reporting, and other DPI required reports. I prepare the monthly financials that Ms. Hauser shares with you every month. I also prepare the grant and gifts report for the board monthly board meeting. I manage the district's purchasing slash credit cards. I maintain the district's fixed assets. I manage the district's scholarship accounts. I maintain accounts and budget for the district's grants and prepare claim forms. I perform or I do monthly bank reconciliations for all the bank accounts. I gather and prepare necessary information for the district's annual financial audit and assist the auditors. And I also supervise the payroll and the accounts payable receivable staff and provide support and backup if necessary. And I also help Ms. Hauser as much as I can. So that's a, that's a few things that I do. <laughs> Mr. Russ, can we please just sign an extension with her? We can't lose this one. <laughs> well, and you forgot that in other duties assigned. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. So um, did we wanna look at the financials? Okay, so what you're looking at now is the year-to-date operating revenue. And then the next slide, is the year-to-date operating expenses. Um, we are trending as, as expected for this month, and Ms. Hauser will be bringing the first round of 22-23 budget revisions to the board in January. Um, does anyone have any questions in regards to these reports? Any questions or comments from committee members? Mr. McKenna? I don't have any questions per se. Um, first, I you could just put, I'm the wizard of Oz, like the woman <laughs> behind the curtain. Um, when you look at these numbers as, as the expert, do they appear to be on track to you? Yes. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Any other questions or comments from committee members? Ms. Lehner, thank you so much for your commitment to the, the district. And we really appreciate all your hard work here. You're welcome. So thank, thank you for you. that.
All right. Item three, business. 3A, discussion and possible recommendation to approve SASD policies as presented. All right. Uh, in, in, uh, on the slides, and um, we shared them with you, um, we went through a workshop. And this one lasted about eight hours, and uh, we didn't get through them all, but our next policy workshop is on Friday, the 16th at 8 a.m. in Maplewood's conference room. If you're interested, please join us. Um, but um, we're, we went through them. We had good discussions. I gave a summary page. Um, but uh, once again, we're making a lot of good progress on our policies and uh, moving forward in a positive direction, having good conversation, having good conversations at, uh, on some pivot points, some pinch points, and some other ones like, nope, that's darn right legal, and we don't want to take that out because we need to follow it. Or we can take it out, and we can move forward together. So uh, just open to any questions anyone may have, um, and just open for questions. And if there's none, I'll leave it over to Mr. Schulze. Questions or comments for Mr. Russ? Go ahead, Mrs. Okay, Lopez. Yeah. Surprisingly, I don't have any questions because you have answered all of those prior to tonight. And I did just want to comment and say thank you to um, you, Mr. Russ, to administration, to the uh, committee members for working on this so diligently and for working collaboratively with one with everyone to come to some good solutions. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Mrs. Lopez. Uh, Mr. Burns Gilbert, I just wanted to call you out here just for a sec, just to make sure the questions you had were answered and, and you were comfortable moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I got a lot of them answered ahead of time as well. So I, I appreciate that. I'm going to dig a little bit deeper, um, but I think a lot of mine were coming down to um, can we include this or that for some of the different languages that whether it's federal that has to be there and, or what can we wordsmith a little bit. So um, I'll come back to that. Yeah. Later uh, before next week's meeting. Right. Perfect. All right. Any other questions or comments from committee members? All right. Hearing none, um, I would entertain a motion to uh, recommend approval to the full board, the SASD policies as presented and be placed under consent. I'll make that motion. All right, I have a motion from Mr. Wells. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second from Mr. Burns Gilbert. All in favor? Aye. 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 Right. Motion carries six, uh, six O. Mr. Hendricks absent. Item 3B, discussion and possible recommendation of approval of policy 31, uh, 5136, personal communication devices. And this is for students. Mr. Schultz, you asked for this one to be placed on uh, a different um, agenda altogether. This is the student cell phone policy that we have uh, district wide. Uh, in summary, uh, it's to be used uh, time and place before school, after school, um, if there's passing periods, high school and middle school has passing periods, uh, and during lunch. Uh, during the academic time, the policy states that they are not to be used during that time. Um, and I can tell you our administration works very hard to do that the best we can. I know we have a lot on the teacher's plate already, and cell phones are near and dear to a lot of kids. Um, they're used very they're, they're used wisely, it's great. And when they're used as a distraction, not so much. So I know our, our building administrators and our teachers work very hard to do the best they can. So um, I know we had some discussion about this at the committee level, good discussion. Good discussion about, you know, use and, you know, before school and after school and that's it, nothing in between. Um, but there's a lot of good discussion that we had. So we can continue that discussion if you wish. Thank you for that, Mr. Russ. Okay, so at, at this time, I'd open up any questions, comments from committee members about uh, 5136 personal communication devices. Absolutely. Go ahead, Mr. Burns yeah. Gilbert. I just, uh, I think option B made sense to me. Um, I think the others might have been a little too restrictive um, and, and being able to kind of have that option for students uh, building community through the the phone as a thing now in 2022 so uh, that that made a lot of sense and I, I think uh, more of a comment um, I wonder if we can whether it be a future board report but just share with the board and community how um, social media etiquette or, or internet literacy these pieces are woven into the SASD experience I think that's one of my 
takeaways, especially over the last, I don't know, five, 10 years of how that's not going away and important for us to help guide our students in that way. And I saw a lot of that come out in some of those other but I'd like to maybe learn more about how that shows up um, similar to the reports we've seen from, from Ms. Everson Risley and from our other employees. Yep, we can definitely do that because it is one of the, the reasons why we have time in place is because our employers are saying the same thing. Use your cell phone at the appropriate time. You will get a break. You can use it at that time. But one of the things that they our employees get terminated for or not welcome back for is not on time and they can't keep their cell phone away for more than 90 minutes. Yeah, and I think part of this, <clears throat> part of this for me is, and the reason I kind of wanted to bring this up at a committee level, um, we're dealing with a, a serious bullying pandemic, or, I shouldn't say that, a bullying issue nationwide, right? And um, too often it's a picture of a student in a classroom that everybody is making fun of, um, or, or these types of scenarios in our districts, not immune to that. It, it happens here as well. And so I wanted to get a feel for where we are as a committee, um, whether we keep the policy as is, or if, if we start looking at a zero tolerance of cell phones in schools. And, and again, is that detrimental to our students and our staff? Is it creating more of an issue? or is it a good, um, good option to move that direction? And so I really wanted to get a feel for where the rest of the committee is um, before we, we delve into that further and maybe let our administration our, and our staff know that you know, we wanna take this seriously. We need to find ways to prevent the bullying scenario by using personal communication devices and through personal communication devices. So with that, I wanna open it up to everybody else. Mrs. Lopez, I saw, yes, go for it. Yes, thank you. Um, I am an advocate for teaching responsible use and time management in lots of areas, including cell phone usage. I am a little bit concerned about how much time this takes from educating our students in the classroom if the teachers are having to constantly remind, whether it is a um, um, whether or not students may be tempted to use cell phones for um, not only bullying, but cheating, perhaps, you know, I don't know how often that happens, but I could see it being a, um, an avenue for that. I do also want to say that those types of behaviors um, regarding bullying or being unkind online can happen in, at any time um, and may not necessarily happen, you know, only in the classroom. So just teaching kids um, all the things that the district is working on, the social emotional type of, um, all of that golden rule guys. <laughs> but I, I personally think that if we were to move in the direction of um, having a zero tolerance for cell phone use, especially at the high school, I think that we would really need to have community input on that and uh, get a feel for what teachers and parents and administration, you know, what everyone thinks on that. Um, I think it would be too drastic to do that without more input personally. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mrs. Lopez. Anybody else have input or, or feelings on it? Mr. Uh, Mr. Rusk, go ahead. And, and piggybacking off that, we need the parent support and the family support now. We need them to tell their sons and daughters and their students to say, put your phone away for this time, time and place. So we do need their help. Regardless, one way or another, we do have some families that we have discussions with. If my kid wants to come and text me for whatever reason, they can do that. We need to know that ahead of time so we can work through those things. So it's really to be proactive the best we can. And we need the family's help. As with everything, this is one we really need the family's help and the kid's help. Thank you for that, Mr. Russ. Mr. McKenna, go ahead. I guess my initial reaction to this, and this is me being old guy, I went to school 30 years ago. There was no such thing as cell phones. School was fine. I don't see where they bring any educational value whatsoever. And they were leading or we had the cyberbullying issue. So my initial reaction was just, let's end them. They bring no value. Let's get it gone. I kind of thought a little bit about it and then the world may be slightly differently now and different now than it was 30 years ago. Um, mine's sitting on my desk. 
We all are. Uh, had we said no cell phones 20 years ago, probably wouldn't have been anywhere near as big of a change as saying no cell phones today. I think if you took them away, the likelihood of it being a bigger issue for our staff than actually enforcing the policy that we have is really likely. Um, do I think they need to be in a classroom? No. But do I think we, we need to have in a world of Columbine and Sandy Hook, kids be able to get a hold of their parents and parents be able to get a hold of their kids? Yeah. You know, 30 years ago when I didn't have my cell phone, there were phone booths right across the street. I could make a call. Um, if I missed the bus, I could wander across the street and call my parents to come get me. Now, if the office isn't open, there is no way. It's just a different world. And I think we need to realize things change. Any other questions or comments from committee members? Go ahead, yeah, Ms. Prestwood. Thanks. So uh, my son is a sixth grader and yep, he has a phone because we all do now who has a landline anymore. But um, they are teaching at that grade level even before like the, the phones have to stay in their backpacks, which I think is a, is a valuable lesson. And if we start it early enough and continue it throughout the grade levels, it's not I mean, they carry them with them regardless, but I think if we start that initiative at the age that we have it in, in the school, I, I think it would be much easier to, to handle the situations as they come up. Great, thank you, Heidi. Any further questions, Mr. Wells? I mean, I, I grew up with this policy, right? I mean, this policy was put into place uh, well before, and even though I, I didn't have this phone till my senior year. I could say, you know, I've seen, you know, I've seen students use them, especially in my AP classes, responsibly and respectively, right? And it really depends on the type of student and how actively engaged they are. So um, maybe it's not necessarily, um, th these things are a distraction. We can't be wrong. And I also fully 100% support whatever the board goes through within whatever we decide but the the important thing is is that we also need to uh focus on how we get students engaged how we change it so that this isn't the most important thing in the world uh learning is right and that's what we're that's what we're here to do that's why we're all here today right we're, we're here to educate the the students and maybe learning to say even though it's by my side learning that self-control, learning that time management, learning what my priorities are or said students' priorities are, are the important things that they need to learn as they grow. Because they won't have, well, when they become, when they go into the workforce, they're not going to have a said policy that, that stops them from bringing their phone into their pockets. It's just not today. Thank you for that, Mr. Wells. All right, I'm looking at my administrators out in the in the the crowd out there. Would you would you like zero zero tolerance policy? Come on up, guys. <laughs> you know, if you, if you want to speak, you gotta come up to the. Because here's the thing, I I I yeah. wouldn't I wouldn't want to implement something that's going to make it that much harder on our administration and our staff. I mean, I that's. That's not where I'm at. So I'm sorry I'm putting you on the spot here, but I think it's really important to hear from you if you want to speak on it. Just so you know, Mr. Ott's an expert on this. I'm not, but I will start. Um, this is a tough subject, and I appreciate that you guys are talking about it. And this is something that our teachers deal with on a daily basis. Um, Mr. Russ and I, over the last number of years, have kicked this around in different policies and different ideas, and different districts do different things. Um, I still hang my hat on time and place. We do have challenges with that. We have students that love their phone more than anything in the entire world, and they will not let go of it no matter what. Um, the reality, uh, in my opinion, of zero tolerance, tolerance is it's not, it's not achievable. Um, that puts the enforcement on the teacher when the student walks in the door, and you'll never really know if the kid has it on them or not. So by default, I feel we end up in the same place, 
which is as our policy is written, it's the, if it's seen, heard, or used without teacher permission, then it's an issue. So that's my thought on it. Thank you for that, Mr. Ford. Dr. Burnett? In my mind, a zero tolerance policy, well, in theory, I would really love to say, yes, let's get rid of them. I really think the only thing that it does is damage the relationships and the trust between educators and our students because they sneak it and then there's a conflict between whoever busts them and the student. Um, so either, no matter which decision we make, it's not gonna be, no matter which decision you make, it's not going to be perfect, um, but it goes back to time and place. And if we could just get them to look at their phone and then put it down, then everything would be fine. Just like you said, Mr. Russ, part of the issue with them going into the workforce is not knowing when to put their phone down. So I don't know that zero tolerance is the answer. Thank you, Dr. Burnett. Mr. Ott? Uh, good evening. Um, similar to my colleagues, uh, you know, in essence, fifth and sixth grade, like they keep them in their backpacks. And I can tell you, we have zero issues. Um, very few write-ups. I know my daughter's in sixth grade and she questions me all the time why I can't change the rule so they can have them at lunch. Um, and that's just not going to happen where we have a gradual release in seventh and eighth grade uh, where they can use them in the mornings and at lunch. Um, and then as well at the end of the school day, um, you know, from my perspective, um, and I know Mr. Sanders and Mr. Dow would kind of go along with it, it. You know, it's the same 15, 20 kids who are the habitual ones that aren't following our policies that we have in place. Um, and we have systems in place and teachers work hard in regarding to that. I agree. Um, with uh, the technology that we have with our iPads, they're not needed. Um, they're not needed in the classroom with what we give students, you know, maybe when they didn't have the one-to-one -one device, possibly back in the day. But, um, you know, for the most part, you know, we do have things in place and we follow through with them fifth and sixth grade. My daughter can't wait to be a seventh grader so she can have it at lunch. So that's what she's looking forward to. Um, but like I said, you know, we'll go with what it is. But like I said, it, it's an issue, but not a huge issue in my mind. Thank you, Mr. Ott. Ms. Everson Riley, you're good. <clears throat> Mr. Russ, I want to open it up to you if you have anything to say. You know, with the zero tolerance, you know, they a lot of districts tried it with alcohol. If you do this, alcohol and drugs, we will bring you to expulsion automatically, no questions asked. Period. When you have the when you have the zero tolerance, there is no wiggle room for. Okay, can you explain a little bit with the one-offs, the emergencies, with this or that? Um, so I, I truly believe in speaking with our employers, time and place, time and place. And can we do a better job educating time and place? Yep, but we have to do it a different way. Very similar to what Ms. Mansky said with the PLC. What do we want our kids to know? Not time and place. How are we going to know it? Office referrals. What are we going to do if they don't do it? What are we going to do if they do? We celebrate them. And we need to bring the employers in because they don't, because the kids unfortunately don't necessarily believe us when we say that when you get a job, it doesn't automatically change your habits. They say, I'm going to get paid. I'm going to do what I'm asked to do then. The data and the kit and the employers are very clear. That does not change. That's why it's so important that we teach those skills. That's so important why we teach our SEL curriculum because that's what our employers are looking for. That's what our kids need. They do need the technical skills, yes. They do need that. But we can blend it together and work together with the families and the kids to come up with a, an agreement and say this is best. And work like Mr. Wells said, we're here to be engaged. If we can get engaging lessons and see relevancy, that phone becomes a distant second, a distance third, or at least not as close to their heart. Because some of those kids, as Mr. Ford said, nope, nope, I'm not doing it. I'll see you later. And so we, can we explain? And they're not willing to talk yet, but we'll still work on them. So thank you, Mr. Russ. And thank you, administrators that came up and spoke. We really appreciate that from a committee level here. Uh, based on the information that the committee stated from our administration as well, uh, I would entertain a motion to approve to the full board and recommend um, that policy 5136 personal communication devices be accepted and placed under consent as written. I'd make that motion. All right, I have a motion from Mr. McKenna. Do I have a second? 
I'll second that. Second from Mrs. Lopez. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 6 0. Students, thank your administration for that. <laughs> And before we get into the next discussion, I might just want to make sure that we're, we're clear on the, we're going to be talking about a leave of absence, but please do not mention any staff members' names. And with that, item 3C, discussion and possible recommendation to approve of leave of absence, Mr. Russ. Yes, attached in board docs is a recommendation for, or is a letter from one of our staff members requesting basically a second semester uh, leave of absence to attend a family uh, situation. Uh, administration fully supports this. Uh, the employee understands that um, when they leave, they are giving up their current job. And when they return, that they have a job waiting if there's one that's in the same category as when they left. So there's no guarantee here. Uh, the employer employee knows this and is willing to accept those terms and the district is willing to to uh, recommend or the administration is willing to recommend this leave of absence to the board. Questions or comments from board members? Yes. Mrs. Lopez. Yes, thank you. Due to my relationship with the uh, staff member, I would like to abstain from this vote. Thank you. All right, further discussion? All right, hearing none, uh, I would entertain a motion to recommend approval to the full board, the leave of absence. This can be placed under consent uh, to- I'm sorry, motion. yes, and be no, placed under fine. consent. I'll make that motion. I have a motion from Mr. Burns Gilbert. Do I have a second? I'll second. A second from Ms. Presswood. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Those abstained? Aye. All right. Motion carries 6 0. Um, Mr. Hendricks, I'm sorry, 5, five 0. 0. One abstention. Thank you. What's that? Yes. Item 4A announcements and information. Mr. Russ. All right, uh, some quick upcoming events. Um, Wednesday of this week, what it means to be a Board of Education member in the Sparta Area School District. If you're uh, looking forward to having an opportunity for the public to learn a little bit more about what it means to be sitting up here or the opportunity to sit up here, uh, we do have our election coming up in April and um, we do have four open seats and um, anyone is welcome to learn a little bit more, even if they're not interested in becoming a board member, just even learning a little bit more about the role and responsibilities I think is very valuable for our community to understand that but 530 in SHS's cafeteria. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, December uh, this Friday, uh, policy workshop, eight o'clock a.m. at Maplewood. Uh, and then the full board meeting is on the 19th of this month due to the holiday. Um, so we're going a week earlier. Uh, no school, 23rd to the 2nd for all those in, uh, in attendance. And then we come back with the committee of the whole on the 9th and then the full board meeting on the 23rd. Um, some uh, happenings in our Sparta Area School District. I'm very happy the way we tried something new. We tried the, uh, the 12 days of dress up at Christmas district-wide. And it's going very well and, and I'm very impressed and thank you to the building principals and the buildings for really stressing that, not just in the staff, but with the kids as well. They're coming up with creative ways uh, to really become together and uh, celebrate the time. As we know that not everyone has as many things at this certain time, but really stress and be thankful what we have, what we do not and not what we don't necessarily have. Um, a lot of positives. We have uh, the wonderful musical uh, performance here. Thank you very much again to Mr. Sonneman and the seventh grade, uh, the choir. Um, this past week, we had uh, seventh or middle school band and choir last week. Well, that was outstanding. And then we had uh, band, I, Mr. Ford band right on Thursday. And then tomorrow, Choir is tomorrow coming up here. So, um, and I know the buildings uh, as well have uh, celebrations as well. I believe Montessori is on the 22nd uh, during the school day. So just a lot of positives happening. And uh, we have a basketball game going on tonight at SHS. Um, our winter sports are wrapping up in the middle school level, uh, but we have a few couple weeks there. But as I walk through the halls and, and wave to the community, it, it's very nice to see all the positive energy and, uh, and it's just so nice to go and getting hugs from the small ones, high fives from the big ones and saying, who are you from everybody else? And say, I just explain who I am. So, but no, a lot of positivity. And if you guys are interested in touring the buildings, I know uh, Mr. Burns Gilbert's coming to the high school uh, in a little while here. I'd encourage you to do that as well. So, um, but yeah, so a lot of positive things. Mr. Russ, how are the elementary hugs going? You doing all right? 
I'm doing very well and it's fantastic. They just keep hugging me and, um, and Miss Evers and Riley's staff just smile and say, yep, this is what it's all about. I made gingerbread uh, men with uh, Michelle's class and, um, and yes, it was darn tasty. We had an administrative meeting and I ate it in front of them with my coffee. <laughs> That's perfect. Speaking All of right. happenings, it was so nice to see you out there in that snowstorm last week on the corner, <laughs> waving to everybody at the middle school. So it made me happy, just yeah. so you know. Yeah. I was smiling as I drove by too. That was great. Yeah. yeah. And I may be out in the rain someplace. I'm not maybe. I will be out in the rain someplace on Wednesday. <laughs> perfect. All right. Thank you for that. With that, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved. Motion from Miss Prestwood. Do I have a second? A second. Second from Mr. Burns Gilbert. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 6 0. Uh, we're going to adjourn and start our next meeting right away. And then if we need a little break, once we go into closed session, we can do that. Um, I do want to let everybody know who's listening that uh, we will stop the recording if the board goes into closed session. Um, so we will stop uh, the recording at that time. And then uh, we will uh, announce as needed. Committee, the whole is adjourned. I'm going to call the special meeting to order. The meeting has been noticed to Evans Print and Media Group, WCOW Radio, Magnum Radio, La Crosse Tribune, Sparta City Hall, and Sparta Free Library. Mr. Russ, are there any changes to the agenda? No, there is not. Thank you. Uh, I'd request a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Motion from Ms. Prestwood. Do I have a second? Oh, second. Second from Mr. McKenna. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 6 0. Mr. Hendricks absent. Uh, Mr. Russ, do we have any public input? Yes, we do. We have two public inputs. Thank you, sir. And if you could, once you approach, just uh, announce your name and, and then the, the floor is yours. Sure. So I'm Jessica Carter. I am a resident of Cataract in the Sparta Area School District. Um, I'm going to fill out a form as soon as I leave here. So <laughs> sorry, it's bedtime. Um, so I just wanted to stand as a representative of the um, cataract referendum committee and thank you all for the opportunity to be on that committee. It was a big undertaking and I appreciate the opportunity. So um, as a resident of cataract, I have seen firsthand the impacts of the school closing. Um, my son last week had a really hard time going to Herman, even though he's been going there for months. So there's just, there's some growing pains and sometimes it feels good, sometimes it doesn't. Um, as we continue to move forward with this process, just thinking about um, Bethany and Aaron and George and creating CES, um, they have fought for cataract and for that school for years. And so one opportunity, one opportunity that was mentioned during our committee meetings was potentially gifting that school to CES, keeping CES as CES. Um, we didn't really discuss it concretely. We wanted to make sure that that was a board decision. Um, we didn't want to recommend it. We just said, that's up to you guys. So, but that would be my recommendation as a way to help the community heal and to help provide that olive branch as a, just a bridge to uh, connect the two communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. We appreciate that. Ms. Johnson, the floor is yours. All right, I'm Erin Johnson and I am here tonight on behalf of Cataract Essential Services Incorporated. Um, you, I'm assuming, all have had the proposal or will be looking it over. And what I really wanted to express is just that we, the three of us, are very passionate about our community. And it was devastating when the school closed, but we feel like this is a way for us to move forward, to keep this in our community, to be able to give back to our residents. And so um, it was difficult to write. Um, how do you put a value? You know, you talk about the $10,000. How do you put a value on that? Um, while we understand that that may not be fair market value, um, it was something that we could do right away. We had the funding. There's not going to be any financing needed for it. And so every dollar 
after this is going to go directly back into our community. This is, um, and, and we're ready, we're prepared to move forward with this. We've talked about fundraising opportunities and how we're gonna bring in some of that initial cash flow um, because we're ready, we're ready to turn the page and start something new and bring something valuable to our community and be able to include not just cataract, but as Arlene said, Sparta, town of Lafayette, town of New Lime, um, Melrose Mindoro has, there's been families from there that have reached out and said, hey, you know, a food pantry sounds great, something closer to us. And so I want you as a board to know that we are not going to give up on this idea if you choose to move forward with it. We are, we are in this for the long haul and we are going to make it work. Um, so keep that in mind as you're doing, going through your discussions. And um, I, I don't know that you'll get three people who are gonna fight harder than what we did. So um, we're gonna continue to fight for that building if it, we go forward and we end up getting it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. I appreciate that. All right, item 2A, discussion and possible action for the board to move to closed session under Wisconsin statute 19.85 parent one, parent E to deliberate and or negotiate the purchase of public property or the investment of public funds or to conduct public business with competitive or bidding implications which require a closed session and to conduct a formal evaluation on the superintendent as per Wisconsin statute 19.85, parent one, parent C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. I'll make that motion. I have a motion for Mr. McKenna. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Second from Mr. Wells, roll call. Ms. Prestwood? Yes. Mr. McKenna? Yes. Mr. Schulze? Yes. Mr. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Ms. Lopez? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. Motion carries 6-0, one absent, Mr. Hendricks. We are now in closed session. <laughs>